Good evening and welcome to the school committee meeting of Monday, February 8th, 2021. We'll start the meeting with the acceptance of the minutes for the meeting of January 25th, 2021. Motion to accept the meetings, the minute meetings. Wait, Tom, you missed. So yeah, I can still motion. Okay, that's what I was making sure <laughs> before we got all through and then we were no, I can read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. There was a motion. And a second. All those in favor? Um, now I'll abstain. All right. Now you abstain, and where me, Emily, and Jamie are voting, yes. So that Madam is Chairman, a vote. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I'm here. I just I can't get video where I am because of the power route. I just wanted to make sure you knew I was here. Okay, thanks. Thank I you. you come up, so um, I'll try to pay attention to when your thing comes up, so we can see. Make sure I call on you. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. All right, we're going to move on to. Did you want to vote on that too, Dan? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Yes. Right. Okay, so four of us and Tom's abstaining. Um, audience, we have Mr. Mahoney from South Shore Votech. He's going to give us an update tonight. Muted. Yeah, he, I was going to say he must be muted. I'll text him. Can you hear Here me? Here he comes. I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. See you too. Oh, very good. Oh. I don't know if that's good or not, but yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, things are going great down the school this year during the trying times as you guys are facing up at uh, Rockland and stuff. But uh, we have been doing what they call the hybrid model uh, that Dr. Hickey's been doing. It's been very successful. Uh, the teachers uh, are able to get two days of face to face in classroom. There. So on an A cycle, say freshmen and juniors, um, they come in two days a week for they get the uh, in classroom uh, with the teachers face to face. And then on the B cycle, they go to their shop for the whole week. So when they're not in the two days in school, they're, they're uh, at home virtual for three days. And then the following time when they come into the B cycle again, they come in school three days and they do hybrid too. So things have been working out very well. Uh, it's been working good. The kids are doing adapting well. They get their full week of shop and they get their academics and they're st get, still getting a couple days of in school face to face with the teachers, which is at this time has really been working out and they're not lacking as much as uh, you know, some of the kids are getting now with the, the loss of some years of education because of this COVID and the virtual, they're just not getting that face-to-face -face thing. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, no, things are going well. Uh, if you want numbers, uh, right now I have, uh, we this year coming in, we've had 244 applications total. Uh, for applying. Uh, we have 55 of those are from Rockland, not all from Rogers, but there are 55 eighth graders from Rockland, which some are coming from the Charter, some are coming from St. Bridget's there. So, um, and we also have uh, numbers, the grand total for Rockland students in the school right now are 144. That's what we have. Grade nine is 32. Grade 10 is 32. Uh, hold on a second. I, my text here is uh, uh, grade 11 is 44, and grade 12 is 36. So we've been trying to see the decline in the numbers of grades 10 and 9 uh, when you know Dr. Cron asked us to try and cut back on some of the numbers when the sending towns like Situate, Norwell, Cohasset, they don't use their fulfillment. We've been always taking a lot of the extra from Rockland, Abington, Whitman, Hanson, those times, those towns there. So we've been trying to cooperate. 
with you guys and keep the numbers down a little bit. Um, so that's where we're at. Good. How's your attendance? Attendance has been great. Okay. Uh, the kids have been adapting well. The kids have been coming to school. So what we do is, Tom, it's a great question because what we do is we have the kids that are in shop. They come in on their regular scheduled time. Shot time is 7, uh, 7.28, I think it is. Uh, Jill may know that time better than me. but um, this, And then with, when they're in shop, they come in early. And when they come in on the hybrid, so when they come in shop, they come in at seven and they leave at one, one ten or one twelve, uh, somewhere around that time frame. And then when they're coming in, then they come back in for the uh, remote, with the in school classroom teaching. That starts at nine o'clock and they're out at two thirty. Hmm. So the buses are double double shifts. Uh, but it seems to be working for us right okay. now. Good. And the attendance has been great. Great. Congratulations. Except for that Thanks. Maroney kid. That Maroney kid's always late, never comes to show up. <laughs> that, that Maroney kid shows up at nine o'clock, whether it's shop week or academic yeah. week. So now I'm starting to wonder. Uh, <laughs> what do we do pick him up at 2.30? Yeah. He definitely is enjoying the Votech. I think it is yeah. a good fit for him. Um, the 12 week exploratory was different for you guys, but um, it was enlightening for us to go through it. He yeah. ended up in a different shop than he thought he was going to pick, and he would not have even picked it if he only had four to pick from. Right. Um, so that was so exciting for us to see him come out of each week and say, yes, I love that or no, maybe not. Yeah. The exploratory is a great thing for the kids to actually, just exactly you said, Jill, for the example was that yeah, they get to go around and example five or six of the shops yeah. and they get to pick those there. So you get to label them one, two, and three. What are your favorites? What do you do? And then it comes down to how you did in those classes, to the exploratory. So you did well, you want that there, so that's you get your first choice. Sometimes you don't get the first choice, so you drop down to the second choice. Um, it's all, they have the whole system there and it works out very well. Uh, some kids, when they get their third choice, well, they may not like it and they leave. Um, but for the most part, we don't have a lot of kids leaving these days. So they have their choices labeled they pick them and they, it works out well. I think so. And this year they stayed in their cohorts. So their academic yeah. and shop were one cohort. And then once right. they were done with exploratory, their academic cohort is still that. And now they're right. just into their shops. Shop, Kevin shop. only has like seven or eight kids in his shop and maybe 13 kids in his academic cohort. So right. they're really getting to be like a close little bubble of your kids. Right, and, and we're using, just like, uh, we, we don't have big space, so we're using the gym as a second cafeteria. Mm -hmm. So the, the social distancing in masks, uh, the protocol are going on there. Uh, we have, you know, anytime there's been uh, a COVID incident, it's, uh, I think we've only had one that happened in school, which we had to vacate everything and then uh, do the shop all over, sterilize and clean the whole shop area. But for the most part, the only cases that we've been getting are where it's been happening outside of the school and parents have been great with communicating that. So, um, and then Dr. Hickey sends out a memo to all the families, to emails about where it happened, or, you know, it's been checking out school, in school, and there. So that goes to the parents. Similar, well, Rockland, we do that I as thought. well. Yep. Um, Dr. Cron sends one out each day, as hopefully yep. it's not always each day if we have a case each day. Right. Um, but it has been a great experience for him so far. He really is enjoying it. Those kids that might well, be him. It's, it's, you know, we, and, you know, we like to uh, extend and, you know, work in the relationship. I know, as Dr. Cron knows, uh, the, you know, public education is a, is a, is a competitive market right now. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's sad to say it comes down to numbers and things like that. And, but it is 
what it is. I mean, you know, you guys have a job to do and we're trying to do that. And, uh, you know, I like to bring in as many Rockland kids that are needed, but, you know, it comes down to, you know, fill, filling buildings and things like that. So things we're doing okay. Uh, we, this coming year, we used to have uh, an out of the district uh, students come in, but because of the numbers from Abington, Whitman, Hanson, you know, Rockland and stuff, they, uh, we haven't had the joy of bringing those in this coming year. So that 244 applications is just from the sending towns. Wow. It's not outside. Congratulations. You know, so. Go ahead, Mr. Biggins. <clears throat> hello, did Mr. you mean Mahoney? to raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you. Um, hello, Mr. Mahoney. Um, first of all, I apologize to everybody from looking, looking. There you go. Like I'm in a bag there you go. There's your face. Me. Yeah. I'm, oh, it just came back on. Um, there it goes. Back we just, forth. we were out of power. We had no power over here on Heritage Drive. And I, I know for a minute there, I looked like a floating head from a bad 80s music video. So apologies for that. Um, yeah. But uh, Mr. Mahoney, I just wanted to comment and thank you for all the work that you do uh, for Rockland students in the Sending District for um, oh. for um, South Shore Vote Tech. Um, yeah. As you mentioned, you know, education um, based upon state law has become a bit of a competitive uh, market, but um, in years past, it seemed the environment was much more set that way, but it seems so much more today in 2021 that South Shore Votech community and Rockland Public Schools are partners more, more than ever before. Um, the communication has been great to my, um, to my observation. Um, you know, vocational education is very important to, for, to be able to offer. Um, I know uh, Mrs. Maroney's, um, one of her children go there. Um, 2021 has never been a time that we need trades more than we ever do. And it's great to have Rockland kids and surrounding town kids have such a great option. So um, thank you, Mr. Mahoney, for working so well with us. And please extend the same to Dr. Hickey. And uh, if you haven't seen you in a while, my friend, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, it's, it's really not... Me, it's the you know Dr. Hickey and the staff there. They do a great job. Um, it, you know Dr. Hickey's on top of everything there, as you know Dr. Crom would be at Rockland. Uh, it's been a trying year for everybody and everything, but uh, right. things are going well. Uh, we have a couple plans that we you know, you'll hear coming forward in the future. Both would be coming through. We've been talking to the town administrator. Uh, we have a meeting with finance, I think the 10th, uh, to go over our budget uh, with the finance committee and uh, the things that we're proposing to do down there at the school and to bring that along there. So with the assessments that we have, I think Rockland's assessment next year goes up $35. So... I, I think that's good news <laughs> mm -hmm. to some of the other towns are, you know, somewhere in the thousands and something, but I think Rockland's is $35 or <laughs> something like that. So, all right. Um, does anybody have any that. questions? I have no oh, questions. Mr. Cron, you must have a couple here. Come on, you, you always well, like to you, like, you always go with the numbers here. So very glad. I'm very glad to hear that things are going well. This is a very trying time. Um, so I'm just really glad to hear your report and, and glad to see you. And uh, to echo Mr. Biggins' comments, thank you for representing the Votech and for being a line of communication for us. But I'm just really glad to hear that things are going well. And in, in my phone is always open, uh, you know, anybody there, I think maybe Jill may have it. I know Dan has it, and I think Dr. Cron may have it, but the, it's always open. And uh, the one thing, too, is uh, to a credit to our athletic director, Mike Hearn, and uh, we're one of the only vocational schools from our league playing sports with sports. Um, so, uh, you know, it's as a, a town, it's a school that has eight sending towns and all towns are playing sports and our kids in our league weren't able to play, 
well, Mike Kernan got together with some other schools and, you know, has joined those kids. Yeah, so now we have, uh, we go down to the U in Hanover mm -hmm. uh, and practice there and then come back and we have games at the school. So we don't have to bother the cap the uh, custodians to break down the gym every night, take down the tables and chairs and sanitize everything there because uh, they, they do a great job at that. So things are working out well in there. So we're able to get sports and uh, I think we're looking forward to uh, the fall two season from the MIAA and uh, see what's gonna happen with that. So. Uh, our Rockland students, uh, student athletes, still have an opportunity to play sports there too. Sounds good. Very good. I do agree that the faculty and everyone is doing a great job over there keeping the kids safe. And I do feel yeah. like they are responsive to anything that I've heard from any parents here in town. So yeah. I do think we didn't know what this year, either at Rockland Public or at the VOTEC was gonna be like, and everyone involved yeah. is doing awesome. Thank you, Bob, I appreciate yeah. you. Oh, no problem. Maybe next year, Dr. Kahn, we can go in and talk to eighth graders in the school. Here we go. That's for keeping the numbers <laughs> down. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I just have to throw it in there. Uh, just all because I, I have to say uh, uh, freshman intake person, Amy Dow, she does a fantastic job. Uh, she's really had her hands full this year with doing everything virtual and, uh, you know, 244 interviews, you know, out of the 55 uh, students from Rockland, I think she has 53 of them already interviewed uh, and she's got the other ones scheduled. So uh, again, they're all not from Rogers. They, some of them are coming from uh, St. Bridget's and the charter schools. So right. we both like we'll to take it from the charter school. So. We'll cross that bridge. We'll cross right. that bridge. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. You. Thank you very much. Anyone have questions before I let him go? No. I see no hands. Okay. Thank you, Bob. All right, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Thank, Thank you. Right. you too. Safe. You too. We'll move on to the superintendent's report with Dr. Cron. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I just wanna begin with a reminder that kindergarten registration is going on right now through March 5th. Um, registration packets were mailed to families last week to be eligible for kindergarten, you must be five years old. Your child must be five years old by August 31st. After the packet is completed, including all required documents, you should then contact your school secretary and set up a time to bring in your packet and documents. We've included in the packets a list of school assignments by street, uh, as well as phone numbers for each school. And the registration packet is also available on our webpage. If you have any questions, feel free to call this office or to call any of the school offices and we'll get you a packet if you need one. Okay, we our diversity, equity and inclusion um, undertakings. Just wanna update the committee on that. The um, diversity, equity, steering and inclusion, equity, steering committee met for the third time uh, recently on January 26th. Just want to remind everyone this this committee includes all five building principals, all three assistant principals. So two are two assistants from the middle school and one from the high school, our high school dean and Freya Leahy, who's helping to coordinate this group. As an extension of this larger central steering committee, each school has formed a building based diversity committee and has begun to engage in important conversations about the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion in each of our schools, and to begin to identify some areas of need. Um, we reviewed feedback from these meetings at our most recent steering committee on the 26th. When we began to look at our strategic plan and our core values through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we found the document was lacking a clear statement or stance 
on these important issues. In a moment, I'll go to it and show you what I'm talking about. We believe that these qualities are implied throughout our documents, but not sufficiently stated. We're therefore proposing the creation eventually of a fifth core value for the district, one that explicitly states our commitment to the ideals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are our current core values, achievement, character, collaboration, and perseverance. And about 30 people in a room wordsmithed every single word that is here, including the ands and the alls and the commas were very carefully scrutinized and, and words were selected for particular reasons. And we use these core values to guide our decisions, especially during difficult times and when money is tight. So when we looked at our core values, we said, you know, it, it doesn't seem to really reflect this idea that we're committed to diversity inclusion um, in our district. We did say that obviously we believe in a safe, inclusive and unified learning environment. We think it's implied there. But I think that recalling our conversations around this, we were, we were identifying the skill of collaboration among students and between students and teachers as a 21st century skill that we want every student to graduate with, their, their ability to collaborate and work in small teams. That is a very important skill um, for students coming, coming of age now. So I don't believe that collaboration was really meant to um, express our commitment to diversity. So the, um, the team basically is proposing a fifth core value and we don't know what we'd want to call it yet. We don't know if we'd choose the word diversity, equity, or inclusion. But our plan is that on the March 26th PD day, each building will workshop their own draft of a new core value. So using these work products after the teachers and staff in each building create their own core value, our steering committee is going to take all of these core values and put them into one. And then we will bring all of that work to the school committee um, for feedback and adoption, hopefully. Um, but I did want you to know what we're doing. Our current strategic plan continues through really through 2020, sorry, through 2023, um, not 25. But I'd like the district to consider re-engaging in the strategic planning process next year because everything is different. So when we planned in 2017, the landscape looked a certain way. Our kids were in certain spots in the, in the linear, you know, sort of their learning process. Everything is different now. And I think it's time for us to start fresh with a new strategic plan, um, hopefully, God willing, if everything is, is back to normal in the fall, um, we could, it would be a good time for us to regroup and to reassess um, our entire strategic plan. But until then, this, this um, diversity committee is recommending that we um, add, to begin things, that we add a fifth core value. And I just was excited about that and wanted to share that with the committee. Before I move on, let me see, what's my next thing? Oh, that's it. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. I just threw a lot at you. <laughs> that looks good. I just wanted you to know that this work is going on, um, as we promised. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it's honestly some of the most difficult work that we're doing, um, as a steering committee, where all the senior leaders in the district, all the principals, the assistant principals, the people who deal with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're looking at these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're realizing how bad we are, quite honestly, at talking about it. And I think that just in and of itself is telling that the topic is very loaded and scary, um, especially when you put a bunch of, I don't mean to be glib, but you put a bunch of white people in a classroom to talk about diversity, and oftentimes it's a very, very difficult conversation. So um, we're having these difficult conversations. We are eventually going to have them also with our students and our families. 
For right now, we're working among the leadership team, and then we're going to begin to engage the faculty at this March PD day. Um, so I'm excited to begin that phase, but then we will obviously branch out into um, including parents and families. So I didn't know if anyone had any questions or I just wanted to update you on that. And that's all I had. Dr. Cron, any questions? Anyone? Sounds good. Go ahead, Ms. Davidson. Oh, I sorry. Like to say, no, it's fine. It's a very difficult conversation and it's a very sensitive conversation. So I think that's why most people don't talk about it. But this is the year of we're going to start talking about it and the groups are going to get together and figure out a plan. And I think adding the fifth value is a good start because it's an open space where everybody can start the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. I agree. Mr. Biggins. Go ahead. Um, look, can you hear me? Yes. And see. Oh, okay, good. Um, sorry. I'm having technical difficulties over here without losing power and getting power. So I missed a portion of uh, your presentation, Dr. Cron, but um, I caught the, t I was able to catch the tail end of it and the discussion about the strategic planning that went back to 2017. I know I remember being a part of that and how important um, that work was um, from administration all the way down. Um, we've got a lot of great people in Rockland public schools and a lot of great perspectives. And um, back to 2017, I think that Everyone was really proud of the work that was done. And I think that we really benefited from having a strategic plan. Any organization of any kind of size really needs to have one. We need to have goals that we're striving for and making sure that we're all in the same boat, not only in the same boat, but rowing in the same direction. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that work will continue, particularly post pandemic, when um, the work of educating our children is obviously um, completely and totally different than it was uh, just a few few years ago in 2017. So um, even though that that wasn't that long ago, um, the work that um, will be undertaken to refresh is super important, not only on the pandemic, but on um, the social issues that you just discussed. Um, that is going to be hard work and it's important work. It's not only important work, but it's 100% necessary work. And I think that your comments on it, Dr. Cron, are really um, uh, really important and accurate in the sense that, you know, we're in a community of Rockland and we do have some diversity here in Rockland, but not anywhere near enough. Um, and we don't near any of certainly reflective of that in our school system anywhere near enough. So when you get a bunch of white folks in a room talking about diversity and the importance of it and sort of the challenges that we have, we're really not fit to speak on that. Um, we haven't experienced, you know, what it means to be a minority in Rockland schools, either as an instructor or as a student. Um, and I would hope that as a part of that, um, that we can do our very, very best, uh, no matter no matter the size of the group, to be as inclusive of we can as we can and encourage our minority community to be a part of that discussion and a part of that exercise. Um, because none of us, um, certainly none of us on this Zoom call, um, are prepared to speak on that. We haven't experienced it in any way. I agree with you, Mr. Biggins. I was going to add to that, that we're expecting our children to sort of be inclusive. And yet here we are talking about it and we maybe not know ourselves on how to be. And if we're going to expect them, then we need to be able to answer that same, those same questions, you know, as adults ourselves. Yeah, so we need to learn. We need to get our ears, our ears, our eyes and our hearts open and we need to learn from each other. And, um, you know, it's not as if this is a completely whitewashed community. We've got uh, folks from a lot of different, um, you know, backgrounds and colors and creeds and races. And um, we can only be better by being as inclusive of, of each of those folks as we possibly can. I if I could add one thing, I, I, um, I think it's unfortunate, but we live in a time of great divide. Um, I don't remember a time that I've studied or lived in that's felt more divided. Um, you're either for us or against us. And unfortunately, many people equate discussions of diversity um, and with anti-police, for example, um, that you can't be um, for civil rights and, and racial justice 
in and be for your local police department at the same time. And I completely disagree with that. And I resent it, quite honestly. I resent being made to feel that I cannot support my local police department and still feel that we have a long way to go with racial and ethnic justice in our country, in our state, and in our school system. So I just encourage us, as you just mentioned, Dan, this idea of being open-minded and open with an open heart. I just encourage all of us to try very hard when you do feel offended to ask yourself, why am I so offended? What about that offends me? Because it, it is a hard topic to discuss and we're going to make mistakes and say the wrong things. Um, but I just, I, I, I really find, I think it's a difficult time to live in. You're either for or against. If you fly a flag at home, then you're against this. If you don't fly a flag, then you're in. And it's, it's, it's very scary for me as a 52 year old man. And I can only imagine what it's like for a 12 or 13 year old child to try to figure that out. So um, I just want you to know I'm committed to facilitating these conversations and to getting us for us to get better at it and to examine and ask difficult questions and to be very inclusive in this process. Um, Maybe I can help out on that being in uh, Boston Public Schools for the last 14 years, um, we, we had many discussions about diversity and, you know, uh, police powers and, and, you know, and all the, you know, all the discussions about, you know, hey, that's not fair, you know, type of thing. So, uh, you know, we can have a discussion about that. Uh, we had that, uh, and then in our school, in the school I was in, uh, we had one white student. All the rest of them were either Hispanic or uh, African American. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, just one last thing. I, um, I think it's been uh, said quite eloquently here um, about learning and leaning on each other. So I was just curious um, what other districts are doing, especially in neighboring communities. And I know each community is going to have different uh, racial and ethnic you know, diversity. But um, we can't be the only school district having these conversations, right? So I just was curious if there, if you, Dr. Cron, um, what other superintendents, what other school districts are doing? Can we leverage each other? I think Mr. Mills said it great. Like there are maybe some school districts that have more diversity that we could learn from. Um, and how do we bridge those gaps and, and elevate that so that we're all uh, opening our minds because it's what we don't know, right? And we don't maybe know how to think outside the box for solutions that might work. So I was just curious um, what else maybe the steering committee is is bringing to the table outside of our own little bubble of Rockland. I think that's a great, it sounds like you're suggesting that we interface with other districts, which I think is a great, um, great suggestion. And we can definitely learn from, from other districts. But I will say that almost like this is a personal journey for individuals. Uh -huh. This is Rockland's journey, that Rockland needs to do its own work and ask itself as a school district, you know, who are we? And what do we want this school to feel like when a child walks in, regardless of whether they're a boy or a girl or what color they are or what their sexual preferences are? How does this school feel to that child? What does this curriculum look like to that child? Do they feel reflected in it at all? Um, do they feel supported by their teacher in the same way that another student feels? So I think it's a very personal, um, which makes it very hard, journey. Um, but we are looking for outside resources and we're certainly open um, to any you know, suggestions and ideas that people get. We did work with a company and get a, we, we actually, engaged with a company to get a quote for them to come in and run this work in the district to bring in sort of an outside resource and expertise. Um, and it was very, very expensive. So we decided to, to do it in house. And, um, but we are going to be engaging some outside help um, because we think we need it. Right. The other, a couple, uh, the other couple of things you have to be cognizant of is also their language and their, and their, uh, uh, and that's uh, their, their, uh, their backgrounds and their culture. 
Right. Right. Dr. Cron, is there, um, and forgive me if such a thing already exists, and if there is, uh, can you tell me about it? But if there isn't, I wonder if it could exist. Is there um, sort of a group or a advocacy group or leadership group that exists within maybe particularly the high school right now that might encourage leadership amongst minorities to be able to discuss um, issues about equality within our own school system or to, um, you know, it, it advance maybe uh, the idea of us opening our minds and hearts to being a more, a more inclusive community. Um, is there a way to give um, our English language learners, um, you know, more of a seat at the table? And is, does such a thing exist from the student level at the high school? It, it does, Stan. Um, they launched a group called Daring Discussions last year. And I, I don't know the details of it, but I do know that they're taking on very challenging questions of our time. Um, student leadership, as you know, is a very big deal at Rockland High School. Dr. Harrison does an exceptional job with student leadership. And he formed his diversity committee and actually included students in his diversity committee. And some of the most um, powerful feedback that he received was actually from the students in that group. And he shared that back to the steering committee. So. Um, I do think student leadership is one of the answers, that um, mentor mentoring is one of the answers. And I do think that there are foundational things that we're doing um, throughout the system that support it. But I think it's time for us to have very pointed discussions about race and, and sexism and gender identity and things like that. But I think that first we need to have that with the administrators and then with the staff before we begin um, work with students and families. But um, uh, uh, I, you know, to, to, not to interrupt you, I'm sorry, man, not to disagree, but, and I don't disagree, but to elaborate on it, I think it's past time that we do that. I don't mean as a district, but I mean as a society. Um, you know, these, particularly at the younger level with these kids, um, you, you know, my, even my generation, um, Mr. Miller's generation, generations before we failed, you know, we failed so far at this conversation. All you have to do is look at the news and see, you know, how divided we are, you know, based upon, um, race and creed and no better place to start those difficult conversations with those that are going to be the ones to solve this problem because we haven't been able to do it together. And, um, I, know what kind of uh, amazing folks we raise in Rockland Public Schools and, you know, having a forum that they can feel empowered to discuss such things and, um, you know, raise them, raise issues within our district and our schools if they exist to help us be a better and more welcoming place, I think is awesome. And I'm glad to hear that's going on already. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? No? All right. Very exciting for the future. Dr. Cron, that's all you had? That's all I have for superintendent's report. Okay, thank you for that. Nothing under communications, we'll move on to reports. We have monthly reports for January. The administrators, Dr. Harrison, Ms. Bond, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Shifley, Mrs. Sheehan. The guidance with, with Mrs. Black, nurse, Mrs. Ryan, pupil, personnel, services with Dr. Manigula. One motion to accept the reports. Four seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, go on to school newsletters for February for Eston, Jefferson, Memorial Park, the middle school and the high school. Um, I wanted to just add to that, congrats to Hannah McCarsky. She was Miss Rockland this year um, in the high school. It was just um, determined the other day with a ceremony. 30 years ago when I graduated, <laughs> her mom was also Miss Rockland. So I thought that was very cool that she got it too. So congratulations to Hannah and the family. Does anyone have any comments on the newsletters? Wait, 30 besides? Years ago? 30 <laughs> years ago. I know I look so young. 30. You wouldn't believe that. <laughs> That's what you were going to say, Tom, wasn't it? <laughs> I did too. I can't believe that. I, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> um, we'll go on to old business with a COVID update. Is that you, Dr. Crum? Me, and I'm going to call on Mrs. Hackett as well. And I will start. Um, 
Uh, uh, these are our current case numbers. Can everyone see this uh, case update? Is that yes. Okay. So these are current um, case numbers. I will let um, Mrs. Hackett explain any anything here that she'd like to explain, but they're pretty self-explanatory. Again, yeah. I send out these first two columns to the entire community pretty much daily. We update this uh, this chart every day. Um, Jane updates this chart every day, um, and I send just this part out to everyone. But this is includes the uh, close contacts and the total number of staff out and, and children out. Yes, a couple, couple things, if I may. One, of course, the big number that jumps out here would be the Rockland High School um, student close contacts and the positives um, at the high school. Um, two thirds of the positives relate to one sports team um, at the school and two thirds of the close contacts result from two athletic teams at the high school. Um, outside of that, sort of an interesting trend um, that I just want to share with you, again, sort of reinforces the lack of transmission within schools. But what we truly are seeing, even more so than before, is unfortunately this going through families. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have anywhere from two to five members of household sick um, at the same time. And they're not just positive, they're sick. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's been sort of sad, you know, to see to see these folks go through this and where the principals and, and guidance, et cetera, I think have been great trying to, to, to reach out and keep these families connected um, and getting them any sort of resources that they have. But it is in even in the, the situations where there's only one person that works for us who is positive their whole family at home is positive. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, it's been, it's a very, it's been a very interesting um, trend that's, that's, it's almost like all we have our families and one sports team at this point, there aren't, there's not, there's sort of no other activity. So in some ways it's really settled down. Um, one thing, again, an additional thing that I'd like to highlight is that with the testing, we really no longer have any close contacts of close contacts who are out. We have eliminated that entire cohort of folks. So even with a team, um, when an entire team goes out as a, a close contact um, by the state epidemiologist, under our policy, their household members are home until they test negative. Now that we have our own testing capability, they're not missing any school, uh, maybe one day. Um, occasionally, um, a close contact of a close contact has missed. We had one child um, miss school today, is going to miss school tomorrow, but that was by the family's choice. They wanted to wait and test later. So the, the family made that choice themselves. They could have tested earlier and had the sibling um, come back to school. So um, fortunately, we don't have we, we, we don't have any reports of serious acute illness still. Um, and we're very grateful <laughs> um, for that. Um, so I just didn't want anyone alarmed by that that high high school number. What, what, what is the trend? Is it? I mean, these are numbers. Of, is it trending up, trending out, or is it even staying staying steady? Well, it's it's going down. Okay, that's that. Good and news. it's good and news. it's households. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's you see it in the report I get every yeah. day from town hall. You know, we were getting you know anywhere from forty eight. You know, now we're getting six or seven a day. Um, of positives, which is still way too many. When we first thought we were in this, the pike, this, this, uh, the peak back in, in April, we'd get seven a day. Yeah, excuse me, there'd only be excuse me, there'd only be seven active cases in Rockland. Now we're considering seven cases a day a low number. Oh, good. Well, uh, we did have a, we did have a day last week with zero cases, so we did. That's a good trend. That yeah, was good. All right, I'm going to continue on. Wait. Uh, Oh, Wait. sorry. Go sorry. Oh. I was going to have Jane share one more. Go back to sharing one more minute. Oh, sure. Sure. Can you just explain? I see this on Facebook every once in a while that people are like, they don't understand your numbers. 
are you adding to them every day? But then, so say I was positive, so I'm reported today, but then tomorrow I'm not any longer on there or am I on there until I come back? Yeah. Great question. Just okay. Yeah. Great question. Um, and there is confusion. I even get myself confused um, over that. What this is, is active positive, positive cases today. So there may be three new middle school cases today, but their numbers may actually go down because four came off. Right. Okay. And that's what's difficult for people keeping score at home, so to speak, to say that this isn't a cumulative total of how many cases there have been at the middle at any particular school. This is active cases that are within the 10 day period from their positive test result. Once they come off of their 10 day isolation, they come off this list. If they're symptom free, if they're not released, they stay on the list. We do have two people who are still symptomatic past their 10th day. And so the two staff members who are at home ill, um, so they stay on. If you are an active positive case, you are on this um, list. If you are a close contact within the 14 days of your exposure, you're on this list. Right. This is a snapshot of a given day. A, this is this is a snapshot as a four o'clock every, every day. I do it. Yeah. Thank you. I think that was I I know you've explained it to me, but I do see people asking other people, yep. and it is a bit confusing then for me to then add in the answer. I'm like I'm gonna like you said confuse myself trying to explain it to them. So I'm glad that you just took the minute. Thank you. I appreciate can, it. Can, can we graph this over a period of time and show that too as part of this report? I haven't. Um, I haven't. Well, I suppose maybe we can go back and, and print out all. Of, of just for like the last thirty days. Not really. Okay. Okay. We if have we graphed it, then we, then you can see a trend up, down, or even. I could I could take a look at that for you, Mr. Okay. Mills. Sure. Okay. Thank uh, you, Jane. You're welcome. I just wanted to talk about an important part of of this is duration of quarantine. So this has come up as an issue. <sighs> recently um, with hockey, but we, we have a 14 day from last date of exposure for student and staff quarantine policy. That is the same as Del, that is, this is what Del Sean Flip has established for, for the community and what we've established for the district. Um, it's consistent with the Board of Health and their approach to other town employees. So same police, fire, anyone who works for the town. Um, some have raised concerns with regard to the duration because some um, do some guidelines do allow for us to have that number at 10 rather than 14, but we have kept that number at 14 because we have had six to date cases that have come back positive after the 10th day, and we've just seen it happen too many times. So we've stuck with 14, but it is raising again some some um, conflict because it is keeping people out of school longer or um, having an adverse effect on what they want to do. But again, for the with safety first, um, we're, we know that we have kept people out of the building who would have been in the building sick um, because of the 14 day rule, at least on six occasions. So we know that to be true. Um, but again, in checking with Delshawn Flip and Kathy Ryan and Jane, um, our three real experts, um, they all concur that we should stay with the 14 days. But it is something that I want to bring up because I do know that it is a concern of some um, citizens. Um, some have reported that because of the 14 day policy, people are not being forthcoming. Um, I can't really do much about this, only to ask that people be honest so that we can keep everyone safe. And that's what it's all about. Jane, did you want to say anything else about this? Um, no, and I think that the testing has helped us, um, again, sort of pinpoint some of these. Again, we're testing immediately to prove negativity 
when people leave school. So we may be testing folks very early, day three, day two, after they've been identified as a close contact. So that's so that first grade teacher's classroom knows that that teacher, although they're out for 14 days, was negative and that no children were at risk you know, of being exposed. Um, and then we're testing that person again, pretty much at their discretion throughout the remainder of their uh, the remainder of their quarantine period. And what we're, what we're found is because now that we're administering the test, we're sure of the dates and et cetera, is we are seeing activity between the eighth and the 12th day with some level of regularity. Is that 14 days calendar or 14 days school, school days? No, it's, it's 14 calendar, calendar okay. days, the calendar days from exposure. Okay. Yeah, how do we so know that? How do we know that these families that are coming up the six that you're referencing um, were at home and respected the rules of quarantine the whole time that they were home? I can't. They attest to it. So yeah. my concern is too. My concern is too is that in an unscientific way, it's sort of seeming to me that we may be rather unique um, in comparison to our neighboring communities and beyond with the 14 day versus 10 day. Um, are you able to comment at all about what our neighbors are doing? I think many in the South Shore League, if we're looking at it from an athletic point of view, I'm fairly certain that most are at 10 um, and some are at 14. Okay. What is so we're the 14 for? for all, not just sports. We're 14 for students inside the school learning and students, for sports. Teachers, staff, everybody, right? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not asking about specifically for sports. In fact, I'm really more concerned with school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems to me, um, just to, again from an unscientific approach, but I would really like it, Alan and Jane, if we could get it a, if we could get sort of a report on what sort of our neighboring communities on the South Shore are doing. Um, you know, I, I can appreciate that uh, with full respect to um, uh, to Ms. Flip and to Ms. Ryan. Um, I respect their opinions and their expertise completely. Um, and we'll follow whatever their advisories are, but, um, you know, given sort of the uniqueness of this situation and all that's going on in the world, I'd really like to sort of know what, what other, how other communities are handling this. What does the Board of Health recommend? Do they have a recommendation? The Board, the, board, the board of Health's recommendation, well, the Board of Health's regulation for town employees is 14 days. Okay, there's a number. So that's for, te that's for teachers through firefighters. Yeah. And we're applying that same standard to the students. So it's anyone in the building. That's good. As we should, as as we should. Um, and I, I'm not advising or, or advocating that we do anything differently than um, that what we're advised to do. Um, but with respect to kids in the building and with education and, um, you know, sports like way down on the list, um, I would just, for my own benefit, like to know sort of so where we stand with uh, in relation to other communities around us uh, status. If I, and, and if I also just could add, Dr. Cron, that a lot of this guidance, the new guidance from CDC, came out right as we were starting to hit the peak. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? So it was it was it was a little it was a little concerning. Like we were seeing the cases go up, and then you know CDC saying, "Oh wait, you only have to be out ten days or seven days," and it all seemed, felt a little bit counterintuitive. I think now the thing. So I think different towns in different school districts were doing different things in response to that. I think now that we're, we're stabilizing, I think it's a beautiful time for us to really reassess what we're doing individually and you know, regionally. Yeah, it just concerns me a little bit that we're doing above and beyond what the CDC would recommend. I mean, you know, I mean, I understand about being safe. COVID is a scary thing. Listen, I, I deal with it on a daily basis myself. But also what's a scary thing is um, our school students and athletes and children missing out on lifetime um, milestones. Um, it, I mean, that, that has an inherent harm as well, yep. uh, aside from COVID. Um, you know, I know we're trying to protect, you know, the, the small percentage of people that may be affected by this, but, you know, there's a larger percentage that are really missing out on um, major, you know, participation in school, participation in um, senior events, athletic events. And these are events that 
I think, um, and I've had this discussion uh, with Ms. Maroney and Dr. Cron a little bit earlier today, um, that cracks are showing in kids now. And honestly, cracks are showing in adults right now. Yep. Yep. Um, this isn't uh, two weeks to flatten the curve anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't just one year anymore. We're looking at like we may have another year ahead of us with this. So I don't think that the goal on our end should be sort of reopening when this all is over because I'm not sure that it's ever really going to be over. Um, at some point, we're going to need to learn to live with this and we're going to need to live and work within it safely. Um, so, you know, I, I can appreciate that we're, we're, we're all coming from the right place of trying to keep our community safe, particularly our kids and our educators. Um, but, you know, for the current issue with hockey and particularly with schooling going forward, um, I really want to caution against being overcautious as well. I, I believe this. I, I, I was reading something in the in the in the newspaper today and watching the news, and uh, I think the state is starting to re, uh, is, is in the process of reevaluating what number of days that we should be quarantined, what number of days we should be closed, what number of days, you know, and all that stuff. And they're coming in with some new guidance, is uh, I think in the next couple of weeks. State of Ed, the Department of Education, as well as the state itself, the CDC, and and uh, the uh, the the health uh, health people on uh, all of the same thing. So we should be uh, cognizant of that, what, they, what they're recommending too. I agree. I think we started this, like we said in the summer with a reopening committee, just trying to get us in safely. We hadn't all been together. We were afraid to all be together. And we made it into the fall with our fingers crossed, hoping to get to Halloween, hoping to get to Thanksgiving and then Christmas. And now here we are and we've been together and we've made it this far and we've figured it out a way. And it is time to start to reassess. That's what we said we were going to do is reassess and see what changes may take place. It isn't just going to be because of sports. It will be because of those kids that are home on 14 days when they could have been back in at 10. Right. Um, but we are at that point now, I believe it's time to start crossing that bridge and seeing what may change. I don't, it's not gonna change today. It's definitely going to take some, um, a few meetings and whatnot to figure out what we all think is safe. I think it's time to gather the information and start to go from there. I agree. Like I was saying to Mrs. Like I, I was saying to Mrs. Moroni, the uh, is that this is one lousy senior year. Right. The same was for last year, and yeah, you yeah. have to remember too: fourth graders, eighth yeah, graders, everyone transitioning. Yep. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Mr. Biggins. While I, while I while I don't think this is about sports, I do think this hockey situation calls attention to the issue, um, and I'm not suggesting that we make a special. Um, a special exception for hockey that we wouldn't make particularly for our students or our educators or any other sport or activity. But I think this occasion for hockey really calls upon us for the occasion to take a hard look at this. Um, these are kids that have, you know, as student athletes done their best through school. Um, they've worked hard to get to the place that they're in as athletes to be able to compete in a sport in which that we've all deemed, we've all deemed and everyone else has all deemed to, um, be safe to compete in um, and it's man what a shame for these kids you know I mean and I appreciate that we're protecting them and their families uh, from this pandemic and the chance that they might be harmed but they most positively will be harmed if they are not allowed to play in this tournament and I understand that uh, why they can't and I support our health agent and again I support support Ms. Ryan um, but in, in, in forgetting whether or not they play in this or not I think this calls upon us now to really take a hard look at this. You know, are we are we in um, at pace with the communities around us and how we're handling this? Um, you know, I just think it's caused to this situation is caused to sort of for us to sort of have this hard hard conversation now. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. There are a lot smarter people than I that don't know what the answer is. Um, but it's time. I think it's time for us to start the discussion. With that, with that said, that's a great segue just to wrap up COVID update. Um, two, two, two final things. One is we are still working every day um, to get a vaccine for our faculty, staff, and faculty and staff. Um, again, we're working our connections with South Shore Hospital, and I know Chief Duffy is also working on um, trying to find a vaccine. So we will be doing that as soon as possible, and it will happen quickly. 
Um, the second thing and final thing is that we have begun a um, we have begun to do a needs analysis for how to return eventually all students and staff to full time school, which is a lot big part of what we're hearing in the news cycle is getting kids back to school. Yep. Um, what one of the things that you'll notice, however, when it's mentioned nationally is there's very little mention of social distancing when they say get everyone back to school. In fact, the um, federal government came out with a statement yesterday, as late as early as yesterday, saying um, we think everyone should be back in school even without vaccines. Um, and my question to them is please explain that to me as a school leader, how to do that safely. Um, so you'll hear in the news that a lot of people are throwing out, get them back to school, get them back to school, get them back to school. But no one's talking about the practical implications, the social distancing guidelines, even that the CDC currently has out. So I think there's a, there's a major push to get kids back in school, but people aren't answering the difficult questions. So it's easy to sort of say, do it. And it's another thing to make it happen. So the way we're gonna make it happen is we're starting, we started today by surveying our faculty and staff and a survey will go out tomorrow to families. And this survey will be asking you questions about if we changed our social distancing guidelines from six feet to three feet, how comfortable would you be sending your child to school? The same questions were asked of faculty and staff and the steering committee that created the return to school plan that we are now using including our hybrid plan, our remote academy and everything, this committee will get back together again. I'm reconvening that same committee. The committee includes two school committee members. It includes members of the um, Teachers Association leadership team, and it includes all of the principals and senior leaders of the district. And we will get together and we will first discuss the word consensus because the word consensus is a very important word as consensus means we may not agree with every aspect of what we're talking about, but darn it, when we make this plan and we leave this room, we're going to get behind it together and row in the same direction. And that's one thing that I think we've done exceptionally well in Rockland, and I, and I hope to continue, and I know we will continue to row in the same direction going forward. Um, but these are, these are going to be very difficult conversations. For some, they're very scary conversations. Um, for others, they're like, I'd send my kid back tomorrow, no mask, I don't care. <laughs> Other people are terrified. So yeah. we, we, are, we are going to begin with a survey, collect some data. The steering committee is going to get back together, and we're going to create a reentry plan and a timeline to get our kids back to school that is aggressive as safely possible, but that also respects, um, respects the, the wishes and the feelings of all of the constituents and stakeholders here. So I do want the, the, the town and the school committee to know that that process has begun um, and we will work on it earnestly over the coming days and weeks. And that's all I have. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? <laughs> A lot of concerns. Okay. I want to say that I keep hearing about this town's doing this and this town's doing this. We're Rockland, and as much as I'm concerned about what other towns are doing, we are little, right? Our schools are little, where the kids are really on top of each other. So just the way we, same way we got ourselves open, we will go through, like Alan saying, the same process to get us to this next stage. But I can't be really concerned with what the other towns are doing. Other towns have way more land, way bigger schools, um, way Way, better ways to sort of spread out and do other things. We're going to do what's best for this town and we're going to work together and like Dr. Cron said, get us all rolling. And our children, yeah, especially our children. I, our I just, uh, Ms., Ms., Ms. Chairman, I disagree. I'm concerned with that information. I'd like very much to get it. Um, I, I think it's very relevant. I know our buildings and our challenges are different, but I disagree. That's why we're all here, Dan. There's five of us for a reason. We don't all agree all the time. So I appreciate you saying it. Um, I like to just stay focused on our little town and do what we can find what's best for us. So we'll get you that information, Dan, if that's what you want for your information. Does anyone that's have any of all of us? 
Yeah, I'm 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 collecting information about what everyone's doing. When someone says to me, you know, Hanover just announced their reopening plan, I spent a little shy of an hour on the phone with that superintendent who was kind enough to give me his time and I asked him how is he how is he doing? And their, their structure of schools is different. Their classrooms are larger in some cases. Um, and there are reasons that they're able to do what they're doing. It, on the flip side, there are things that we're doing that other towns are not able to do. Um, so we, we are absolutely gathering what other towns are doing. Um, in fact, I have a spreadsheet on my desktop right now that is tracking um, how towns are rolling out their return, returning school, kids to school plans. Um, how, how many feet are they going by? How are they gonna do their lunches? How are they handling transportation? So all of the practical, I wanna know what everyone's doing because it does inform um, our decision. So we are collecting that information and I will definitely share it with the, with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I guess I just meant that we understand what they're doing and it doesn't always relate back to what Rockland's doing. We don't have all these big massive schools like Hanover does to be able to spread our kids out. So that's all I was saying. Yeah, safety for us. Right. Anyone else? Nope. Dr. Cron, is that all you have? That's all I have. Okay, we'll move on to new business. FY22 budget, Jane. I'm gonna start. Oh, it's you? Yeah, it's me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm, I get tired of hearing my own. Let me. Let me well, what do you think? What do you feel on this side? No, I know. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Alan. Oh, oh. Okay. See, I got. I paid for that one. Okay, budget update. So, I've gone through this with the individual, uh -huh. with them individually, but just for the community's sake, I'll go through this rather quickly. And um, Jane, feel free to jump in at any time. But Governor Baker's budget um, that was released last week was very scary to the town of Rockland. Um, chapter 70 is partially based on enrollment and our enrollment declined by 3.2% from last year to this year. This is not unique. State enrollment declined by 5%. RPS homeschool enrollment went from 24 students up to 46. This should surprise no one. Um, more people chose to homeschool. We also believe parents held back their kindergartners. They figured it's a COVID year, we'll hold our kindergartners back. I don't know if they intend to enroll them right into first grade or enroll them into kindergarten. But if our current kindergarten um, mailing is any indication, our kindergarten numbers are very high this year so far. I'm, I'm hopeful. I think this is a one year blip is what I'm saying. We also graduated a large senior class, about 25 kids more than, than our average senior class. I wanted to point out again, um, the town meeting budget, we, we proposed our FY21 actual of in chapter 70 for last year was 14 million seven. This year again, um, proposed in the governor's budget is only 14 million seven, $67,000 um, more this year than when we were expecting more like a 1.4 to $1.6 million increase in chapter 70. The other thing that I wanna point out over here is this is the town's contribution to our budget, um, to our operating budget. The town contributes in other ways like paying health insurance um, for our, for our um, teachers and our staff so there are other ways that the town contributes, but this is the amount of money that the town has been given, giving to our regular budget over the years. And you can see that it's actually gone down since FY22. So I'm just sharing some numbers. Um, budget forecast, I wanted to point out it, with this slide, some of these highlights. Um, these are these numbers that are highlighted are the use of revolving funds. And um, they are very concerning because we have these revolving funds for a move-in in, in the spring, perhaps, that is an additional uh, special education cost that we didn't plan on. Um, there are many reasons that we maintain these revolving accounts, but we are relying quite, 
quite heavily on them this year. With the cut to the budget that the governor's proposal um, recommended, it puts us at a $2.2 million, $2 million deficit oh. heading into FY22. We can cut that deficit right out of the gate with the ESSR money, ESSR2 and ESSR1. This money was intended to be used to close learning gaps with children, um, not to close budget gaps caused by um, COVID-related reduction in enrollment. Um, so although we're glad that it's here, um, it's not what it was intended to be used for. Um, we are also carrying over 500,000 that we were able to carry over this year um, to help us reduce next year's deficit. So we've got this deficit down to 565,000, 566,000 really at this point. It's very early in the budget process. So as I said before, the governor's budget is first and then we'll get two more budgets and they generally go up. Um, I will say that we've been engaged in some advocacy. Um, we are trying to identify our peers who are in the same boat with Chapter 70, those who lost significant funding, um, hoping to be a voice at the state level. Uh, we did mail a letter last week to um, mail the letter last week out to um, Representative DeCoast and to Senator Keenan, asking him, um, telling him about our situation, describing our situation, and asking for an audience with the House Ways and Means Committee who will be passing and distributing the next level of budget. So we're very, um, we're very interested in that. We are also, I already said that, we're working with the town to identify potential ways they could give us some more money. Um, if there's any way for them to do that, that will certainly help us. Um, we're obviously scrubbing our own budget breakage, which is um, when someone who makes say 80,000 retires and we're able to hire someone at 45,000, the difference is, is what we call breakage. Um, we're, so we're, we're looking at all of our possible um, funding sources. The final thing that I will say about this is that we have, since this whole thing began in March, turned over every stone for every penny possible. We engaged in substantial furloughs, um, substantial furloughs of our employees. We saved about $1.3 million by furloughing um, throughout uh, the spring last year and even over the summer. So I feel very confident in saying that we are doing everything possible to save every penny possible for the taxpayers of Rockland. Um, I am concerned that we're using, again, the ESSR money to, to, um, to fund our budget rather than close gaps and remediate. And I don't think that's the spirit of the Student Opportunities Act. And so I am hoping that our state government will um, do something to say hold harmless districts like us who are severely hurt by COVID related reductions in enrollment. Again, we are not alone. Um, and I also want, we're, I'm concerned because we've held off on new math curriculum at the elementary and ELA at the middle school. So I would like to see us be able to use our ESSR money for things like that rather than closing um, just salary related budget gaps. Um, Jane, did you have anything you'd like to add? We could just go back to the slide before for a moment, if, that's, if you wouldn't mind. No problemo. How about that one? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> These are my children before they were driving cars. For <laughs> okay. uh, just, just on here, just to speak a little bit about the revolving accounts. I just want to use daycare you know, as an example. We were carrying approximately pre-COVID about a $330,000 balance. We are now paycheck to paycheck uh. in daycare. Uh. Um, and you, it, we're same thing building rental. You know, and you can see it in the reports. You know, the the monthly reports um, that you receive. You know, we're not renting our buildings, so our revenue. We're, we're struggling in preschool. We're struggling in daycare, and we're not getting the building rental 
um, revenue that we used to have. So that takes away three sources of revenue out of the revolving accounts, from the revolving accounts that we used to have. We used to use about $125,000 a year out of the daycare account to supp supplement our general fund. Now we're going the other way. General fund supplementing um, daycare and preschool. So the, the road that we're on is not sustainable um, because we're utilizing non-recurring or declining revenues to fund ongoing increasing costs. Uh, what we're hoping is that we're going to regroup over the course of this year with our enrollment and next year. And I'm really viewing 23 as a bridge year, FY22 as a bridge year to 23. And I just wanna assure you that everything that we've done in this fiscal year has prepared us to face this deficit challenge. Just like last year in March, we were looking at that 1.3, $45,000 at a time to close that gap. We've been doing that all this year, the team in the office, Joan, Ira, uh, and Donna Capeless. We've been watching everything. Um, and that's why you know I'm not ringing loud alarm bells, you know, so to speak. Um, you know, 600,000, you know, in looking at $600,000 deficit in January. You know, there's a lot of time between now and July, uh, between activity that could happen at the state level and activity that could happen um, at the federal level. And we get everybody back in and we're running our regular programming from a daycare perspective and from a before and after school perspective, revenues are gonna start coming back in. So I think this is short lived, um, it's serious, um, but you know, I, I, I remain confident that we can meet the challenge. Thank you, Jane. Dr. Cron, did you have anything else? No, that's it. I, I, um, I, I think we're, I'm waiting for good news. I'm very hopeful that the feds are going to come through with some relief. I'm very hopeful, hopeful again that the House Ways and Means Committee will will take a look at our situation and and do something about it. I'm sure that um, they did not intend. I think it's an un, it was an unintended consequence. Um, so I'm very hopeful that things will turn around. But uh, as always, I'm glad that Jane is um, is working for the Rockland Public Schools. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'm going to a Chapter 70 workshop on February 22nd. So. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Getting away from you, Alan. Three, probably... hours, three hours of studying a formula. That is right up your alley. Yeah. Jane, I want to commend you and your team. I know that you started right away at trying to figure out um, how to save money right from the get-go. You were already forecasting that we were going to dip in the hole. And you really did come out saying we weren't gonna, you know, go down that far. We weren't going down without a fight. I know that this was something that's been on your mind from day one. I know you eat sleep um, this this budget and COVID. You've been wearing two big huge hats this year. Um, so I do, I've said this to you already, but I wanted to say it publicly that we thank you that you are here and your team um, for being sure that we're staying afloat as best we can. Yeah, it's a, it's a thank you. It's it's a it's it's just an amazing team. It really is. Thank you. Does anyone else have comments, questions? No. Nope. Nope. Just that. Yeah, I do. Go ahead, Emily. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, honey. So on mute. There you go. Have you heard? Um, DeCoste or Keenan from your letter that you sent? I have Any not. Feedback? No, I'll, I'll be following up with them tomorrow. Huh. Let okay. me know Thank you. if you need me to make phone calls. Absolutely will. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Biggins. Since the Board of Selectmen's presentation this past Tuesday night, have we reached out to the Board of Selectmen um, to communicate with them as far as the school's budget and our challenges ahead? Yes, I have asked to be on the next Board of Selectmen agenda. I will be on the agenda.
to go through a similar presentation just to walk them through how the chapter 70 budget has, has influenced us and they were included on the letter. Um, they were CC, Doug was CC'd on the letter and they are aware of it. So they do know that we're, we're reaching out to our um, state delegation to try to get some support. Excellent. I, um, I'm sure it's no surprise. I mean, we're sort of in a fiscal perfect storm right now. Sure. Um, costs from, you know, obviously COVID costs that couldn't have been anticipated over a year ago. Um, receipts are down, revenues are down. Um, it's sort of a fisc fiscal perfect storm for Rockland Public Schools. And I imagine for, again, every community around us as well. So I'm sure it's not a unique problem at all. Um, I'm glad to see that we're reaching out to our um, local political representation with um, Senator Keenan and Representative DeCoast. Um, but I think more locally grassroots, I think we're going to have a lot of work and a lot of conversations that are going to need to be had with the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee. Um, communication is going to be the name of the game with this thing right now. Um, I know we're all, all departments in our community and all communities are up against this right now. And the only way to do it is together and with a really good line of communication. So I, um, I just want to stress to make sure that this committee and uh, our administration stays in great communication with uh, our counterparts at the town level. I agree with you, Mr. Biggins. I think that this year we are in great teamwork with them. Um, we trust them and we feel like they are thinking of the students and trying to do the best for us. So I wholeheartedly agree with you, Jan. Any other thoughts, questions? No, um, I would ask the committee to um, join in on the selectman meeting if that is possible, if we can get the um, Zoom information when we get put on that committee meeting. I think it shows that we are dedicated to have us all attend to that meeting as well. Tuesday, February 16th. Thank you. Mad Madam Chair, I'll send that to you after this meeting, all you guys. Thank you. I, I, I had something, just uh, everybody, citizens of Rockland, be careful, need something, ask. You know, if you, you know, if you need help, if you need help with resources, call somebody, call, you know, call, you know, if it was particularly the, particularly the children, if they need something, just, just ask, see if we can help them. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Nope. Dr. Cron, are you oh. all set? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll move on. We'll go. go ahead. Go yeah. ahead, Tom. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Go ahead, please. I'm all set. You're all set. Dan, are you all set? Yes, ma'am. And Dr. Cron, you're all set. And I was just making a silly comment about Dan's dog. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice Dan's dog. The poor in thing. The bedroom, and she uh, is getting a little frisky, a little uh, pushy. She wants some love. So, <laughs> everyone, say hi to Millie. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll move on to FY twenty two capital requests. Yes, um, the I do not have these um, written out as yet, but. Um, I don't believe we're going till March 3rd to finance committee, but I just wanted to put it on your radar screen. It'll be the same request, um, our yearly requests, the $100,000 for IT and the leases for our vans would be the two measures. So I just asked for support for a vote for, uh, for me to be able to submit two measures, um, 100,000 for IT and the cost of our leased vans. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Jamie, yeah. you're saying aye? Yes, aye. Thank you. And, and, and I'd just like to highlight again the absolute incredible work that the IT department has done this year um, in getting these Chromebooks. First, you know, just for Lizzie and getting the, the grant that we were able to get for the $224,000 for these Chromebooks and all of the work that the IT department is doing each and every day. I wholeheartedly agree. They are working their tails off. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so that was FinCom meeting uh, March 3rd. That's another one I'd like you all to attend if that's 
fits in your schedules at I, home? I believe there was a tentative date that was uh, that was tossed around. I'm not sure if that date has been confirmed. Yeah. Can you email us all the dates? Oh, I'll put them in the next package, next Thursday mailing, something. Definitely will. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'd like to support our team if we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have that as a vote. So we'll go on to request for approval of fundraisers. It's finally my turn again <laughs> from Dr. Cron and Jane. We have the Rockland High School class of 2024, my grandma's coffee cakes. They're going to sell them from February to March. And we have the Rockland Public Schools, the PAX, Dining for a Cause at CC's Pizza. And the CC's Pizza is a Rockland family. They are going to do that. That is actually this week, I believe. Look. Oh, goodness. It is it says the 10th. The 10th. Yep, February 10th. Right. So um, do we have a motion? Two motions. Two seconds. Two seconds. OK, all those in favor? Aye, aye. Aye, aye. <laughs> no, Millie, Dan, where'd she go? She oh, thought we were right sure. <laughs> she, she says I. She does. All right. So Woo! that's <laughs> we are out of control. Um, that is that. So we will start with public service announcements. Mr. Biggins and Millie, we'll start with you tonight. <laughs> um really just true. that, you know, just that I know, you know, as we referenced earlier today that. Um, you know, it's getting tough. I mean, we've been all in this boat together for quite a long time now. And, um, you know, no, it, 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 traditional wisdom would sort of suggest that we should be getting used to it. But and really, I think the truth is that we're all sort of showing our cracks. Um, it's getting a little bit hard. We're in the doldrums of winter. Um, I know my own kids are sort of struggling with this a little bit with, you know, the nature of how school is and how sports is and how society is and um, it's tough for all of us right now. And, um, you know, I, I know, I don't know when normalcy is ever going to come or if it ever will. Um, but I just hope that it's some time that we can sort of work within and safely work within the measures in which we're given right now. It breaks my heart to see, um, our sports teams, our seniors miss out on events that, you know, that they've been looking forward to for really their whole lives and that they really won't get this back. Um, and, you know, I know it's not us that's stopping them and it's not, we're not making the decision to you know, have a, a pandemic, but man, it just breaks my heart. And I just hope that someday and that sometime soon that we can find some way to be able to live within the um, challenging world in which we live. Um, I'm looking forward very much to getting back to in-person school committee meetings. Quite frankly, it bothers me a little bit that we're still meeting remotely. Um, we're asking our students and our kids to come into school every single day. We're beginning right now to look into the idea of potentially having our kids come back into the school buildings. And it bothers me a little bit as of a committee um, that we're still sitting here meeting remotely. Um, we're asking our um, teachers to go to work. We're asking our kids to go, asking our kids, asking our kids to go to school. And we're still here um, meeting remotely. So I look forward to getting back in person, seeing all your faces and getting back to work together and being able to have our kids be able to work within some kind of normalcy um, in the world that we live in now. That's all I got. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Mr. Mills? I, I concur. I, you know, like I said earlier, the seniors or any of the schools, I mean, you know, just the last couple of years, you know, uh, almost a, it's a, a year now, uh, going through this uh, is, is, you know, it's, it's just, I, it's, I guess that for me, it's unbelievable. I, I can't I think of another time, uh, you know, even through the Vietnam War and all the stuff that went on, you know, in schools and in the, in around the you know, the country at that time. But this is uh, this is this is uh, crazy. This is uh, um, I don't know, unbelievable. I guess is that you know. And the only thing is, you know, yeah, be careful out there. If you need something, ask. You know, don't hesitate. Talk to somebody. If you, 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 that's if you need help, just to, somebody to talk to approach somebody you know talk to a teacher talk to you know uh you know and so, so, and anybody you know and uh and uh, get the help you know just talk and you know what, what's going to happen you know because we don't know so have a peaceful and uh you know you know a safe time at this point 
Thank you. Mr. Mills. Emily, we'll go next to you. You're next to me. Um, I would just like to um, kind of echo what everyone has been saying. I do want our students to be back in schools um, as soon as possible, but at the same time, I want everybody to be safe um, and continue to be healthy. So that has been our top priority all along. So I think we need to continue that as our priority. And that's all. Thank you. Mrs. Hennessy. Um, I, I, I probably it's been said already. Um, so just, uh, be safe and take those mental health breaks. Um, I think Dan mentioned, we, and as you know, the weather is very cold and dark and dreary and um, the winter blues are a real thing, I think. So um, with President's Day and February school vacation next week, take that time to really unplug, right? And just use that break to recharge and let's come back for the next uh, rest of February, March, and, and hopefully we'll be having some good news with reopening plans and uh, all the great COVID, no, well, the, not the great COVID, but the decline in the numbers, Massachusetts numbers are going down. Yeah. Um, hopefully the town numbers continue to go down. Um, so just uh, remember anytime those large gatherings, you know, break time, hopefully we don't see a, a surge after that. So just, uh, enjoy that week away, both staff, um, everyone on the call, Alan, Jane, Donna, everyone deserves that break. Um, so both st uh, staff, parents, students, enjoy it. That's all. Thank you. I think she's given you guys the week off. <laughs> it's done, I signed it right there, <laughs> approved. They're gonna log off right now and run away. Um, I agree with vacation week coming. I think it is a good time to sort of decompress from all of this that we've been living through. Um, I myself was talking about February vacation and then talking about April vacation with my kids. And then we were thinking summer. We're already into February that we're already getting that much closer. So to me, that is a wonderful thing with spring and summer because the weather is definitely getting us. Um, so everyone stay healthy and stay safe. And I, that's all I have. Motion to adjourn. We're all muted. Second. So. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 That's the five of us. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Peace.